So today is the part two of the equanimity factor of awakening. And, um, you know, it's also part of this series on mindfulness of breathing, which the Buddha presented a little bit like a path that as we stay present for our breath, that we're cultivating and deepening the meditation practice um, with a deep relaxation of the body, a deep relaxation of the mind, until um, we're not just focused on the details of our life, the particular activities of the body or the mind, but we start becoming aware of the mind state, the state of mind, the quality of our mind, the feeling of kind of the gestalt or the wholeness of awareness that can just be here holding it all. And um, it's a fairly, you know, mature place in, in meditation that we might fall into occasionally where the, the, the mind state is more salient, more pr- prominent than the particular details of what's happening in our body or the details of what's happening in our mind. All of these, all of the, all of the above are important, but uh, to uh, be more holistic in the practice to some point to get a sense of that, the whole, the mind as a whole, the mood, mind state that we have. And those mind states have various characteristics uh, when we get more and more settled, when the mind feels more whole or expansive or clear, the greater clarity and mindfulness. And the seven factors of awakening are part of that. <clears throat> and the last one, equanimity, is part that when the mind, when we're really stable in the strong awareness with a strong sense of being aware in, this, in our mind state, a healthy, wholesome mind state, um, it tends to come with a, a strong sense of equanimity. And equanimity being um, very simply not getting caught in the reactivity of the mind, of being for and against things. And, um, and it's a wonderful uh, capacity. We still might be for and against things, might have those thoughts or impulses a little bit, but equanimity, we just simply don't pick it up. We don't get involved. They just pass through. They're just fleeting kind of impulses of the moment that come and they go. And, um, and we, don't, we don't pick it up. We don't get involved. And um, it can lead to a tremendous social good because uh, when we don't uh, respond socially into the world by our reactivity, by the quick impulses of being for and against things, then uh, uh, we're more, more likely to be impartial in a really healthy uh, f- uh, understanding of impartiality, where we uh, treat everyone equally, or we don't uh, treat people through the filter of uh, our desires and our aversions, kind of leaning into and wanting, or pulling back because we don't want or something. Uh, we, don't, we don't so easily get pulled into our preferences. And so a sense of justice, a sense of impartiality, a sense of being someone who's safe for other people um, becomes more and more, more stronger the, the more we have this equanimity, this ability to not get caught up in our reactivity or, or these impulses of being for and against all kinds of things. Uh, there might still be wise being for and against things, but that wisdom builds on equanimity, on being stable and settled. It's not impulsive. Uh, there's a clarity and a wholesomeness in how we respond to the world. So equanimity is both something for deep meditation and for um, everyday life. Uh, it's a really a great boon for life. In deeper and deeper meditation, um, that's some place where some people can really feel this state of equanimity in a very powerful way that gives us a feeling for it and then a support of what it's like to bring that into our daily life. But in the Anapanasati process, it's very much re- the, the reference point for it, it is in meditation. And so in meditation, the equanimity is what allows the mindfulness to be uninterrupted, to just stay in the flow of awareness here, here. And we don't find ourselves drifting off in thought and coming back two or three minutes later. Uh, we don't find ourselves um, getting caught and preoccupied by what's happening. Uh, we might be very attentive to what's happening, but we're not caught by it. And so the steadiness of mindfulness, it just holds the course, holds the course, um, keeps walking, keeps engaging step by step. 
um, equanimity so it kind of allows that steadiness and continuity of awareness. And um, equanimity, the upekka, uh, as I said yesterday, has a lot to do with wisdom. So having an overview of the situation. And it's not a wisdom that's acquired knowledge that we bring with us and apply, but rather something that we deeply understand as we go along. And there's a variety of things. Uh, one can be that um, it's not worthwhile getting being reactive. It's not being worthwhile being caught up in, in thoughts or thought up in our reactivity. It's just not valuable for us. And we can feel that and sense that directly. The other is that um, uh, we can have a clear sense, feeling for the impermanence of phenomena, the inconstancy of it, how things come and go and change. And um, to really understand that me, uh, means we don't tend to relate to things as if they're going to be there forever or if they're, you know, something that's fixed that has to be fixed, something fixed that has to be fixed. And, uh, and so having a clear sense, oh, this is impermanent, this is change as well, uh, can let us set back and just be willing to sp- be present, be aware. The wisdom of not taking all these things personally, that I'm not unique, that my experience is not unique, that uh, many people have meditation, probably all the experiences we've had in one way or the other, others have had as well. And it's one of the primary roles of sometimes of a meditation teacher is to normalize people's experiences. And uh, for the most part, uh, to normalize, just make it ordinary, it's okay, it's just part of the process. So we can keep coming back to the equanimous mindfulness, steady mindfulness that doesn't get perturbed or agitated by no matter what is happening, no matter the fear or the pain or the suffering or that we're experiencing in meditation. It's all normalized in a certain way. So not taking it personally is one of those ways. And um, so there's a variety of kind of wisdoms that come into play that really supports this ability to stay equanimous balanced, unagitated in, in our experience. The, um, but also this equanimity comes from a sense of balance. And balance has something to do with inner strength that, that we cultivate. When there's a strength of mindfulness, a strength of concentration, a, st- a strength of stability, um, then uh, it's kind of like we have a, um, a, um, a uh, you know, a, a stability we have a, um, something that holds us down, keeps us grounded, um, uh, allows us to withstand the winds of the mind, the winds of change, and things that come and go, and to, f- and to develop that strength by the continuity of meditation, meditating maybe almost every day and regularly, and developing this. It's like the mind is an instrument that can be developed and strengthened and trained. And... Um, not everyone develops their mind. Everyone trains their mind to be a strong, um, be strong. And part of what ongoing regular meditation practice is about is not just showing up and being mindful of stuff and accepting of stuff, but also developing an inner strength, a capacity to let go, a capacity to really stay present and be steady with experience and not wander off in all kinds of things. A, a, a strength of concentration a strength of even joy. So as we get stronger and stronger, we're not buffeted so much by the winds of change, the winds of what goes on. And so we're more able to kind of hold the course and hold the course. And so as the, uh, as the ninth step of this uh, Anapanasati, mindfulness of the mind, is to um, start... Uh, experiencing and sensing that we have this amazing resource, this amazing uh, uh, thing called citta, called mind, that we want to care for. That's a reference point for uh, uh, a well-being, a wholeness, that any kind of suffering we have is a subset of. And so when the mind is really uh, spacious and open, expansive, present, and we're aware of the citta in a more bigger way, it's much harder to take our greeds, our attachments, our lusts, our addictions, our hates, hostilities, regrets, resentments, our fears, as being all there is. Uh, They all become a piece of the puzzle. They're not the whole puzzle. The whole puzzle feels more like the mind 
that can be aware of it all. And um, and there's a lot can be uh, a feeling of, of great goodness, great rightness, great kind of in that kind of sense of a mind or this inner life which is whole. And um, and so whether it's completely whole or feels completely kind of as satisfying as I'm saying here, uh, that keeps coming now as we continue the practice of Anapanasati. Uh, step 10 is gladdening the mind or feeling the satisfaction of the mind, of being connected to this mind that feels more whole. And then the, the, um, the 11th step is uh, samadhi, is concentrating the mind or unifying the mind, which we'll talk about soon enough. And that's what makes the mind even more whole. So it's a fantastic process here. And, um, and uh, I know that it's not easy to experience all these things I'm talking about, but um, part of the confidence in practice is to know that you're on a good path. And, um, and part of the equanimity that comes with practice is the confidence, this is a good path to be on. I can just walk this path steadily, keep going. I don't have to be too concerned about how far I've gotten because I know I'm on a good path and, uh, and I'll keep walking. So thank you for today and I look for, forward as I almost every day do now of coming and uh, sitting and teaching here with you. Thank you.